I would also like to take this opportunity to commend the work of the High Commissioner, his office, and Human Rights uh, Council, former presidents, with their bureaus in ensuring the continuation of the Council's work during this challenging time. As we celebrate two significant milestones in the field of human rights this year, the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the 30th anniversary of the Vienna Declaration and Program of Action, it's critical to come together to address our most pressing challenges. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Kazakhstan fully stands for the rule of law with the UN Charter as one of the cornerstones of the international multilateral system. Tireless efforts have been made by Kazakhstan last year to further strengthen the promotion and protection of human rights and to build a democratic society on the basis of President Okaev's political reform packages. Kazakhstan has taken a course of further democratization and liberalization. Significant reforms have been introduced transforming the entire political system of the country and bringing a course of further democratization and liberalization. Significant reforms have been introduced transforming the entire political system of the country and bringing tangible social economic changes. On February 7th this year, Kazakhstan signed the optional protocol to the Convention on the Right of the Child on a communications procedure. This step reaffirms Kazakhstan's commitment to ensuring the right of child and enhancing legal protection of children. It's another example of the transformations taking place in Kazakhstan along with the ratification of the second optional protocol to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights on June 24, 2022. In addition, the National Fund for Children will be established to ensure the well-being of Kazakhstan's younger generation. From 1st of January 2024, 50% of annual investment income of the National Investment Fund will be allocated to special saving accounts for children until they reach the age of 18. Furthermore, the initiative of President Tokayev, the government is for the first time introducing the National Youth Development Index to create conditions for the development of young people to fully participate in the decision-making process and development of the country. Together with the countries of Central Asia and Mongolia and with the assistance of the ICDP, we are working to declare our region as the world's first death penalty free region. Our shared respect for the right of, to life and peace is reflected in the fact that Central Asia and Mongolia is already a nuclear weapon free zone. Mr. President, last year Kazakhstan held a referendum on amending the Constitution to implement the reforms initiated by President Tokayev. The amendments aim the cons to consolidate the final transition from super-presidential form of government to a presidential republic with influential parliament and accountable government. The constitutional reform significantly strengthens three pillars of power, enhances the system of checks and balances and increase uh, local governance. Protection of the constitutional rights of citizens is a main priority. As a result of the reform, the Constitutional Court has been created, which began its functions on January 1st this year. Now, citizens can directly apply to the Constitutional Court to protect their rights. It's an important step towards building a legal system based on the rule of law in the new and just Kazakhstan. Furthermore, the constitutional amendments have enshrined in the Constitution the legal status of the human rights ombud person. As part of the constitutional reform, the procedure for registering political parties has been greatly simplified. In particular, the registration threshold has been reduced fourfold from 20,000 to 5,000 members 
while the threshold for parties to enter the lower chamber of parliament has also been reduced from 7 to 5 percent. The inclusiveness of the electoral process is ensured through the legal introduction of 30 percent quota for women, youth and persons with special needs in the distribution of the mandate of the MPs. All these institutional changes will strengthen political competition and ensure the openness of the political system. On March 19th this year, parliamentary elections will be held in Kazakhstan. One of the main differences of the upcoming election in comparison to the previous ones is the use of mixed majority proportional model for the lower house of parliament. Now, 70% of MPs will be elected proportionally from political party lists and the 30% by majoritarian rule from single member districts. This system will ensure the entire spectrum of views and opinions of voters will be covered. Mr. President, Kazakhstan has entered in the second year of its membership of the Council as trustworthy and reliable partner. We are determined to continue our work in the most constructive and positive manner. This year, Kazakhstan intends to present a draft resolution on safe and inclusive learning environment. We would appreciate constructive engagement and support of the Council. Mr. President, when the world is facing new global challenges and instability, ensuring human rights is more important than ever. It's becoming crucial to strengthen multilateral dialogue and trust at the global level. What can we rely on to counter today's challenges? History provides us with only one answer, political will, dialogue and cooperation. In this context, we reiterate our call for effective multilateralism as the best available tool to overcome major challenges that face us all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Prime Minister. Now let me invite the first Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Foreign Affairs of Serbia, uh, His Excellency Madam Ivica Dacic. Mr. President, Mr. Secretary General, Mr. High Commissioner, Excellencies. Today, when we mark 75 years since the signing of the Universal Declar Declaration of Human Rights, we have a good opportunity to remind ourselves once again that uh, it uh, constitutes an inseparable part of the UN Charter and its fundamental principles. Only if we ensure the equality and full rights of every individual will we be able to unlock the full potential of all of us. Therefore, we have the opportunity, but also the duty as state officials not only to reiterate our commitment to the tenets of the Universal Declaration, but also to give new momentum to collective efforts aimed at preserving, protecting, and promoting human rights. It is a sad fact that in the 21st century, we continue to face violations of basic human rights everywhere in the world. For Serbia, it is certainly the most painful that we are facing such cases in none other than our southern province. In Kosovo and Metohija, the provisional institutions of Pristina systematically prevent the right to a dignified, safe, and secure life of Serbs and other non-Albanian population. There are numerous examples of this that testify that the non-Albanian population in Kosovo and Metohija, just because of their different national and religious affiliation, faces on a daily basis the restriction of freedom of movement, the denial of basic civil rights, and the discrimination in all segments of life. The current unbearable situation caused 
With the national and ethnic intolerance of the current Albanian leadership in Pristina is best illustrated by the fact that according to UNHCR data, out of the total number of over 200,000 internally displaced Serbs and non-Albanians, the percentage of returnees is below 2%. I will remind you that Serbia is among the countries with the largest number of internally displaced persons in Europe, and uh, that it was a body of the United Nations, the Security Council with Resolution 1244, that set sustainable conditions for the return of internally displaced persons to Kosovo and Metohija as the primary responsibility of the international presence and the provisional institutions of self government in Pristina. At the same time, Serbia has been pointing out in international forums for many years that persons in long-term displacement need to be given the right to choose between local integration and the return to their place of origin, which applies to both refugees from Croatia and Bosnia and Herzegovina and internally displaced persons from Kosovo and Metohija. Along those lines, Serbia has also submitted its comments in the process of drafting, drafting uh, the UN Secretary General's actions ag agenda on the internal displacement, published in June 2022, and we expect the competent body, bodies to continue to contribute to finding a permanent solution to this issue. Serbia is committed to avoiding politicization to an object, objective and uh, non-selective approach to the issue of human rights, as well as to the provision of assistance to UN member states in promoting human rights cap capacities. The importance that Serbia attached to the field of human rights is reflected in continuous effort being made to en enhance the national legislation in this area. In accordance with the practice of active cooperation with the Human Rights Council, Serbia has issued a standing invitation to special procedures. At the end of the 2022, the special rapporteur on the, on the promotion of truth, justice, reparation and guarantees of non-recurrence visited Serbia and preparations have been underway for the visit of the Special Rapporteur on the promotion and protection of the right to freedom of opinion and expression, which is planned for the end of the March. I would like to point out with great pride out that Serbia is the first UN member state to develop the instrument for the implementation of the leave no one behind principle from the 2030 agenda. The instrument was officially presented in September last year, and uh, it will enable the achievement of necessary synergy in the development, in the development of public policies that will eradicate all forms of discrimination and uh, inequality. Serbia also pays great attention to issues of social, economic, civil, and political rights, particularly taking into account the cultural and the religious diversity of our citizens. Aware of the pluralism of our country, we are particularly proud of the fact that the protection of minority rights in the Republic of Serbia is at the highest level and in line with the highest international standards, including those of the Council of Europe and the OSCE. In our country, the minority policy is guaranteed by the Constitution, and Serbia has also been successfully applying the system of protection and promotion of the rights of national minorities for over 20 years through the model of national councils, which is financed from the state budget. We wish to show by our own example that the protection of minority communities symbolize, symbolize the maturity 
of a society aiming to encourage others in our region to pay due attention to this topic, especially when it comes to the position of the Serbian national minority. In accordance with its commitment to fulfilling the obligation assumed by the ratification of international instruments on human rights through the implementation of accepted recommendations, Serbia pays special attention to the universal periodic review as a tool which has ensured equal treatment when considering the state of human rights in all countries. Our dedication and expertise in the field of human rights was also recognized through the election of an expert from Serbia to the Human Rights Committee. I am convinced that Dr. Tiana Shurlan will provide a quality contribution to the work done by this important committee. In conclusion, I emphasize that we are committed to effective multilateralism and constructive dialogue as the best means for overcoming the numerous challenges we are all facing. I would like to once again express my support to High Commissioner Turk in his upcoming efforts and to express my expectation that we will work together to achieve the priorities you have outlined in the Human Rights Appeal from 2023. You can count on the active contribution of Serbia which will continue to cooperate with the competent bodies of the United Nations at all levels with the aim of strengthening and protecting human rights. Thank you for your attention. I thank you, Mr. First Deputy Prime Minister. Now we will hear another video message delivered by Don Pramud Vinay, Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Foreign Affairs of Thailand. President, High Commissioner, Excellencies, distinguished delegates, allow me to congratulate you, Mr. President, on your election to this important body. We are meeting here today at a pivotal moment as we celebrate the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and 30th anniversary of the Vienna Convention that led to the creation of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights. The occasion calls for all of us to assess and reset, not the goals and standards of the Declaration, but the way we endeavor to apply and implement them to preserve and restore the fundamental human dignity that we deem universal. To do so, we need to address the root causes of the degradation of human rights situation around the world. There are three main formidable foes to human rights, wars, internal political and economic strife, and a triple planetary crisis. The most worrisome reality is the fact that these foes have been spreading around the world, both in intensity and complexity. The advent of social media has somehow exacerbated the binary mentality and the my way or the highway attitude, the unfound sense of entitlement, culture of impunity, and the tyranny of a few. The challenges, both old and new, conventional and unconventional, required us to think more progressively and innovatively how to bridge the growing disconnection between standards and reality while resisting the temptation to take measures and actions that could render us part of the problem, not the solution. Equal worth of every person is the core driver of our work. Such worth is blind to any political, financial, economic, social, and racial views. It entails equitable access to opportunities. Violence and hatred breed more of the same. Apathy turns human rights injuries into permanent damages. The right to life and human security is decimated by wars. 
and the reprisal of nature deprives so many lives of their livelihood. These are some of the root and associated causes of human rights deprivation. The Human Rights 75 Initiative is a comprehensive response to address the challenges of our time. On our part, Thailand has strengthened our resolve in advancing the principles of freedom, equality, and justice for all, as enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We also pledge our support for the work of the Human Rights Council and the reinvigoration of the non-confrontational consultation process, as well as well-balanced constructive dialogues and engagement with all relevant stakeholders. Thailand believes that the Universal Periodic Review, the UPR, is an important mechanism to continuously reinvent and readjust our effort to maintain the hope of human rights. The UPR Plan of Action was recently approved by our cabinet. It signifies Thailand's full commitment to the whole of government and the whole of society approach to support the universality, progress, and engagement of Human Rights Council. Our Universal Health Coverage, UHC, scheme has been one of the most powerful tools to help ensure equitable access to health care services while contributing to the efforts to address social and economic inequalities. Thailand has adopted the BCG economic model as our national agenda to counter the triple planetary crisis that are increasingly raising havoc with human security. We also continue to further strengthen our national human rights infrastructure. Last year, the National Human Rights Commission of Thailand was re-accredited with an A status. Such development reflects our unwavering commitment to the letter and spirit of the Human Rights Declaration. Thailand has also actively engaged in open dialogues with the OHCR as well as special procedure of the HRC and other human rights-related mechanisms. Mr. President, in reiterating our commitment to advance the promotion and protection of human rights nationally, regionally, and globally, Thailand has decided to present its candidature for the Human Rights Council membership for the term 2025 to 2027. We are honored to have been endorsed as the candidate of ASEAN and look forward to constructively and actively working with the international community to promote effectiveness and strengthen the work of the Council for the advancement of human rights for all. We will continue to be a balanced and moderate voice that seeks to garner empathy that turns challenges into opportunities and calls for hope and not despair. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Prime Minister. Now let me invite to the podium uh, His Excellency Mr. Chan Lu Quang, Deputy Prime Minister of Vietnam. Mr. President, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to congratulate Your Excellency Vaclav Balic upon your election as the President of the United Nations Human Rights Council, and I'm confident that under your stewardship, our session will be a great success. It's now 75 years since the adoption of the Universal, Universal Declaration on Human Rights. Humankind has since made great strides in realizing our aspirations for human rights. A multitude of international treaties and the Vienna Declaration and Program of Action have been adopted. These instruments provide a strong foundation for the international community to further awareness and act in greater concert. Yet wars, conflicts, violence, poverty, inequality, and injustice loom over the everyday life of millions of people. Natural disasters, epidemics, climate change, environment degradation, food and water, is, and water insecurity are intensifying. The COVID-19 pandemic has reversed hard-earned progress made in ensuring human rights. 
the people in many places, especially vulnerable groups, are driven into harsh circumstances. I wish to convey the deepest sympathy from the government and people of Vietnam to the governments and peoples of Turkey and Syria for the tremendous losses they have suffered due to the recent earthquake. Vietnam has expeditiously provided assistance in terms of finance, search, and rescue personnel and equipment to help those afflicted soon return to the, a sense of normalcy along the international community. Mr. President, I thank all member states for electing Vietnam as a member on the Human Rights Council for the term 2025-2025. We are privileged and at the same time deeply aware of this hefty responsibility. Vietnam enters the council with confidence backed by its heroic history, its proud achievements in the Doi Moi process and social economic developments, and its consistent policy of people-centered development. Vietnam is determined to shoulder its international responsibilities on the basis of a foreign policy of peace, independence, self-reliance, multilateralization, and diversification of international relations. Having overcome the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic and economic instabilities, Vietnam's 2022 GDP growth was 8.02%. 92% of its population is covered by health insurance. Vietnam is among the leading countries in the region and the world in women participation in politics, with 30% of its National Assembly deputies being women. As a lower middle income country, Vietnam stands among the countries with high human development index, with a jump of five steps from 2015 to 2021. These provide a solid foundation for us to further improve the lives of people as we work to realize our vision and aspiration of becoming a modern, industrialized country by 2045. Vietnam is strongly committed to multilateralism, international law, and UN the UN Charter as a member of many multilateral mechanisms. We will work hard to build bridges and promote cooperation at the UNHCR in line with the theme of our membership, respect and understanding, dialogue and cooperation, all human rights for all. Allow me to elaborate in the spirit. First, we all share the same aspiration for the promotion and protection of human rights and a better life for all people around the world. At the same time, each country and each region may adopt a different approach suitable to their particular circumstances history, political system, culture, social economic conditions. It is therefore vital to understand and respect the particularities and seek commonalities instead of politicization, imposition, or interference. Second, no country can single-handedly tackle issues of global proportion today. Dialogue and cooperation based on adherence to international law and the UN Charter are the best way for all countries to seek a common voice, identify priorities, share resources, and together deliver on the goals and targets under the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and related climate commitments, while leaving no one behind in the developmental process. Third, all human rights are universal, interrelated, and interdependent, forming a unified whole. This requires a comprehensive approach. We must pay further attention to ensuring better enjoyment of the most essential and fundamental rights, such as the rights to peace, to development, to education, health care, employment, non-discrimination, and the promotion of social justice. Fourth, the Human Rights Council needs to play a central role in the promotion of dialogue in the spirit of constructive engagement, equality, and effective cooperation among nations and on the basis of mutual respect and understanding. An effective, active, objective, harmoniously diversified, non-politicized, and non-divisive council shall be the nucleus to hold the international community together. With this in mind, Vietnam proposes that the Human Rights Council adopts a document to reaffirm the values of and a commitment to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the Vienna Declaration and Program of Action. This will be a concrete and meaningful action to commemorate the 75 years of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the 30th anniversary of the Vienna Declaration and Program of Action. We share the sentiments of the Secretary General of the UN that all countries need to make efforts to establish a new social contract centered around the people for its policies and actions and create an opportunity for developing countries to speak their voice. 
bearing high conscientiousness and resolve of a member of the Human Rights Council of Vietnam will contribute with the utmost sense of duty to the work of the Council for a better future for all mankind. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Prime Minister. Now we will hear on the last video message of this morning, uh, this time delivered uh, by His Excellency Mr. Wopke B. Hextra, Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Foreign Affairs of the Netherlands. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues and friends, as we meet here today in the shadow of the one-year anniversary of the illegal invasion of Ukraine, it is painfully apparent that human rights are under severe attack. Clearly in Ukraine, which is witnessing rape, deportation, and child abductions. In Russia, where the repression of civil society and independent media is unfortunately almost complete. And in so many other parts of the world. And this is a time that calls on all of us not to stand by in silence, but to speak out. Speak out in support of the international order in which all countries are treated as equals and might is not right. Speak out in support of the universal values, rights and freedoms as set out in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, written 75 years ago and still so very relevant today. And that is precisely why the Human Rights Council is so very important as the world's main forum for protecting and promoting human rights. A forum not only for dialogue and discussion, but also for action. So it is with pride that we announce our candidacy for election to the Council for the term of 2024 to 2026. And we do so knowing that membership is and should not be a free ride, and knowing that it requires us to invest in this role and show backbone by speaking out about human rights violations, sure in the knowledge that nothing will change if we do not stand up for what we believe in, by looking critically also at our own country, because no country has a perfect record. It is and it will remain always work in progress. And by engaging with each other and reaching out in a spirit of openness, by conducting a constructive, equal dialogue and by working together. Realizing that working together is the only way to understand each other and move forward. We're very grateful for all the Council's impressive collaborative endeavors. And we want to encourage countries, large and small, to seek election to a seat on the Council. We want the Council to remain fit for purpose. In our vision, the Human Rights Council must protect the human rights of all people, everywhere and at all times. And this means preventing violations and providing assistance and conducting independent investigations. And we want every member to champion human rights Human rights can never be optional for any state. And that is why we should always speak out about violations and abuses. Human rights cannot be optional as they are interlinked and indivisible, be they political, civil, social, or economic rights. And they cannot be optional because they apply to each and every one of us. And that is why we must ensure that women uh, and LGBTQI a community can exercise their rights to the full. That is why we must ensure journalists and human rights defenders can do their work without fear. And that is why we have to strive for accountability, an issue that is very close to our hearts in my country and close to my own heart. And that is why the Kingdom of the Netherlands wants to be your partner in promoting and protecting human rights. Ladies and gentlemen, even in a year in which human rights are being trampled upon so shamefully, I do see glimmers of hope. In Iran, brave young girls and women, young boys and men are risking their lives to protest for their rights. 
It is a courage of this kind that our world so desperately needs. And perhaps we should ask ourselves the uncomfortable question. What do we ourselves risk by speaking out? I think that if we are really honest with ourselves, we will see that we risk far more by not raising our voices. So we must listen to each other and have the courage to speak out when we witness injustice. Because only in that way can we promote and protect human rights. I thank you very much. I thank you. Now let me invite to the podium uh, His Excellency Mr. Julio Cesar Ariola Ramirez, uh, Minister for Foreign Affairs of Paraguay. Sir, please. Distinguished President of the Human Rights Council, permanent representatives, your excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is a very great honor for me to address the Human Rights Council in order once again to state the commitment of the Republic of Paraguay to promoting human rights, international law, and our full commitment to the multilateral system. Multilateralism is the best tool that we have in order to build the consensus that we need to solve the common problems besetting humanity, uh, to solve divergences, differences, and confrontation, and we need to respond to these challenges with more and even more multilateralism. In the times that uh, we live now, we see that resorting to threats and use of force against sovereign states uh, have not disappeared. In this respect, uh, strengthening the universal human rights system is crucial to prevent conflicts. And all of this legal and institutional framework was uh, established in order to build peace. It's only by following it that we will honor our promise to preserve future generations from uh, the scourge of war and untold horrors, maintaining security and peace and making progress towards development for all our peoples. Your Excellencies, the participation of the Republic of uh, Paraguay in the Council is uh, a very clear testimonial of our will to tackle the very complex uh, challenges that know no borders together, poverty, climate change, pandemics, organized, uh, transnational organized crime and migration. And that's just to mention a few of the challenges. For this reason, before this council, we have uh, presented the resolution creating the mandate of the Special Rapporteur on the Promotion and Protection of Human Rights and Climate Change. In this framework, we make a call for a recognition of the special challenges that face, are faced by uh, landlocked developing countries. They need appropriate financing um, of mitigation and adaptation policies. Um, pursuant to the principle of uh, common but differentiated responsibilities. We also work to strengthen the global health framework to make sure that we are better prepared for future emergencies. And in order to do this, we actively participate in uh, negotiations within the WHO as members of the executive board, defending the principle of equality as a cross-cutting principle. Furthermore, Paraguay will continue to promote and support uh, initiatives which uh, focus on eradicating poverty, focusing on the most vulnerable, aiming to strengthen the implementation agenda. In this framework, we will continue to focus on uh, national implementation mechanisms and follow-up reports, not just through the presentation of resolutions. 
but also by bringing technical cooperation based on the experience of our uh, national mechanism, the Simore Plus. Your Excellencies, we are shocked at the worsening situation of human rights in uh, Nicaragua, where civic space is particularly affected. We see systematic repression and arbitrary detention of political opponents, human rights defenders, and journalists. And we've seen the closure of more than 2,000 NGOs. It is uh, a moral obligation of the Human Rights Council to send a clear message to victims so that they know that they do not stand alone and that the system is supporting them, ensuring the renewal of the mandate of the group of experts. With respect to the situation in Venezuela, we welcome the work done by the Office of the High Commissioner and the recent renewal of the Memorandum of Understanding for a further two years. We hope that this will contribute to Venezuela forthwith implementing the recommendations of the Office of the High Commissioner. We would also urge Venezuela to allow access to the fact-finding mission established by this council in order to be able to make progress in uh, investigations and in accountability. President, distinguished colleagues, it is essential to strengthen this council and with it all procedures, mechanisms and structures that uh, make it possible for it to be operational. We must uh, strengthen states, a commitment to the decisions taken within this body and that's the only way that we'll be able to strengthen its credibility and guarantee the efficacy of all the measures which have been put in place to protect human rights. Secondly, it is essential to ensure that it has uh, sufficient resources which are commensurate to the importance of uh, the issue of human rights. We will continue to work to ensure that this is a body which continues to fulfill its mandate as one of the most important bodies to strengthen a comprehensive human rights agenda which will allow us to move towards societies which are uh, fairer and more inclusive. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Minister. Now let me invite to the podium Tanaist, Minister for Foreign Affairs and Defence of Ireland, uh, His Excellency Mr. Michael Martin. Hi, Commissioner, uh, Mr. President. It's a privilege to address the 52nd session of the Human Rights Council. The illegal and unjustifiable actions of Russia in the past year have demonstrated the need for an effective multilateral system and of upholding the rules-based international order. The Commission of Inquiry established by this Council has found that violations of human rights and international humanitarian law, as well as war crimes, have been committed during the conduct of hostilities in Russia's aggression against Ukraine. The international community must continue to condemn such actions and progress efforts to hold those who breach international law to account. We will continue to call for an end to the conflict and the horrendous violations of international law that have occurred. We must work with others to achieve justice for the civilians who are bearing its brunt, including through actions of this Council. Mr. President, as we commemorate and celebrate 75 years of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, there is no better time to remind ourselves of the principles of uni universality, inalienability, indivisibility and interdependence of human rights. All people have the right to live in dignity and to have their human rights and fundamental freedoms respected. And yet we see worrying trends across all regions. Civil society space is under pressure across the globe. Human rights defenders continue to endure reprehensible attacks. Acts of intimidation and reprisal against those seeking to engage with the UN continue to rise. Violence against women and girls remains pervasive. 
gender equality gains are being eroded and climate change threatens us all with the most vulnerable at risk. We have a collective obligation to do better, to take meaningful action and address these human rights issues. Mr. President, commitment to human rights is a central pillar of Ireland's foreign policy. We take very seriously our obligation to respect, protect and fulfil human rights and we are strong advocates for the promotion of human rights internationally. Ireland is a long-standing champion of the role of civil society in Geneva, in New York and across communities globally. We are gravely concerned by the pressures being experienced by civil society worldwide and in particular by reports of actions that prevent civil society actors and human rights defenders from carrying out their work. Russian authorities continue to crack down on civil society, liquidating yet another prominent human rights organization, Moscow Helsinki Group, in recent months. Just this month in Algeria, we saw the dissolution of LADDH and RAJ, two of the most important human rights organizations in Algeria. In Cambodia, one of the last independent media outlets in the country, Voice of Democracy, was re recently stripped of its license to broadcast. And in Iran, we have witnessed the repression of young women and their supporters, prevented from protesting peacefully for their rights and the application of the death penalty to citizens who are exercising their right to freedom of opinion and expression and the right to peaceful assembly and association. Civil society organizations play an essential role in promoting international law, peace, human rights and democratic values and should have our unwavering vocal support. Mr. President, we are increasingly concerned by the rollback of progress on the rights of women and of LGBTI plus persons in recent years. While the erosion of the human rights of women is perhaps most starkly represented by the situation in Afghanistan, gender equality is facing challenges in many countries across the world. I am also concerned to hear that 2022 was the most violent year for LGBTI plus persons in Europe in the past decade. The rights of women and LGBTI plus persons are human rights and therefore must enjoy the principles of universality, inalienability, indivisibility and interdependence. Mr. President, we continue to witness the tragic impact of conflict resulting in human rights abuses and violations of the most vulnerable. In Ukraine, Myanmar, Syria, Yemen and elsewhere, staggeringly high numbers of civilians, especially women and children, continue to suffer the devastating impacts of conflict. The independent mechanisms established for Ukraine, Myanmar and Syria are doing important work in collecting and preserving evidence to further efforts on accountability and justice. We deeply regret, however, that there is no mandate to monitor the human rights situation in Yemen. The people of Yemen deserve sustainable peace. This will not be possible without justice and accountability. Mr. President, in recent years, the Human Rights Council has taken important and principled action to respond to human rights crises in Ukraine, Iran, Nicaragua, Afghanistan, Sudan and Ethiopia, amongst others. While each of these situations is distinct, the Council has responded, mandating human rights monitoring, seeking to progress accountability and addressing impunity. The Human Rights Council must continue to respond, even in the most challenging of situations. Over the past two years, Ireland has had its third universal periodic review and reviews under the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the Convention on the Rights of the Child. We welcomed the opportunity to engage with these vital human rights processes.